I'm hoping it's not going to be basic. Um, I'm hoping that some more people are going to come in. Um, actually, I thought it might be quite interesting, uh, just, as a, just as a little test, um, if you want to all stand up. Go on, everybody stand up. Because it's kind of like getting to the middle of the afternoon, right? You've had a lot of people who've just basically talked at you for like three quarters of an hour. Um, uh, what I want you to do is go and find somebody you don't know, introduce yourselves, and go and sit next to them. So do that now. Come on, move, people, move. <laughs> see, you see how easy that was. So it was kind of nice, right? Um, uh, what did I get you to do that? I have no idea. I just thought it might be quite uh, interesting. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with offshoring. Um, what it has got a little bit to do with, let's start having a chat. What's up? Um, what it has got a little bit to do with is, is uh, a little bit of team bonding, right? You've just kind of you've just got up, you've just you know, used a bit of energy, you've just gone and said hello to somebody. Um, I've got to stop going up on the stage. Uh, and what we tend not to do when we build teams is kind of do that introduction, right? And this whole talk is about um, my experience with offshoring and, and teams, what are agile teams, um, uh, and kind of how do how do you how do you get the best out of offshoring teams, right? So um, so this is how to offshore like a boss, right? It's a bit of a play on words. There was that kind of internet culture thing where it was going, yeah, like a boss, you know. It's like I'm kicking it like a boss. For me, we often associate. I'm kind of doing myself out some slides later on, but we often associate bosses with negativity. And I find it quite interesting now. We've got some internet culture that says bosses are great. And I really kind of don't, I don't know, I'm finding it hard to kind of to, to play the two. So before I get a little bit further, um, we've got to kind of do the, you know, thank our sponsors, because for, for which I wouldn't be here and this conference wouldn't happen, all these kind of things. So um, you'll have seen this slide many times so far today. Um, cool. This is a little bit about me. Um, uh, <laughs> I did this as an experiment in, in Agile Greece a few weeks ago, but I thought I'd put my LinkedIn, just see, who, see how many people did it. And uh, actually quite a few people did, so I thought I'd try it again. Um, but you can look me up on Twitter. Um, I tend to tweet or retweet mostly, um, mostly about Agile stuff, and then uh, as my tattooing gets more, you probably, <laughs> you probably just see more tattoos pop up on there. Um, and then I, I created a, um, a, 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 I bought a domain, I bought a couple of domains, Agile Coaching Rocks, yeah! Um, and I bought kind of Agile, uh, Agile Training Rocks. And I've done the typical thing, you know, you buy a domain and do absolutely nothing with it. So you can go and hit the domain, it's got a nice picture and that's about it, there's <laughs> nothing more on there. So, I had an idea, as I always do, they said, um, Andy, would you like to come and talk in Agile Bosnia? And I went, yeah, I'd love to come and talk in Agile Bosnia. He said, what are you going to talk about? I said, I have absolutely no idea. I'd done something similar about teams, but I hadn't talked about offshoring in particular, because a lot of the ways I've worked in the past, we've had offshore partners, offshore people, um, and uh, I can only think out of kind of out of the five or six companies I've ever worked with that only one was successful in offshoring. And I thought actually it might be quite interesting to go and talk about what actually made that successful, what was good, what, why did it actually work. Um, so today, this is a quote by a mate of mine, who I'm sure won't mind me nicking it, but I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know, okay? Like uh, probably a lot of the stuff you're hearing already, um, <laughs> and if this puts you off for the next half an hour, you feel free to leave. Um, oh, and by the way, it's not, a, uh, it's not a misprint on the thing. I am doing another talk later, but that's, that's another story. Um, but I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Okay, so a lot about Agile is common sense, okay? but it's all the common sense things that we just don't ever bother to do. Um, you know, your, your question about how do we get junior developers into, into the mindset of Agile, well, you just have to do it. Okay? And you have to kind of get them trained and coached, and you just have to kind of get them into it. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay? So I wanted to start simply with this stuff. right? Business and people, uh, business people and developers must work daily to, uh, throughout the project. Daily, uh, sorry, together daily throughout the project. Okay, 
statement we all know. Um, what tends to happen is we um, alienate these business people and the developers and the, the, the business people sit separately <laughs> and we have crazy old people from Lord of the Rings um, uh, saying, your plans have no power here. Um, so I, I'm going to give you another one, okay? So the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face, -face, okay? This is exactly what I got you to do. See, I'm, see how I'm linking that random thing I got you to do? Um, but this is exactly what I got the, the people who are here, where I got you standing up and we got you talking, right? Face-to-face -face conversation, okay? What we tend to do is kind of separate, okay? And we have, we have these great boundaries of separation and communication between developers and the business people, developers and architects and, you know, developers and everybody else. And when I say developers, I include the testing team and all those kind of things. But even then, we have separation within those groups, okay? Uh, build projects around motivated individuals. Who's motivated right now? Woohoo! Oh, we got three, three, four, five. Okay, so... Um, Motivating people is really hard, okay? It's not easy. You hear the kind of, we're going to buy them pizza or we'll give a carrot and a stick method, right? I think the most important part of that statement is actually the environment you build around those people actually will motivate them. Motivated people thrive on creative, buzzy environments. So you build the environment around them and they... <laughs> build it and they will come. But, you know, they build the environment around them and you'll find you'll have motivated people. You've got to kind of support them, okay? Who's awesome? You're awesome, right? I love that. Um, finally, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Okay, we know this, right? It's, it's an interesting play, this one, because what people tend to pick up on is architectures. Now, we have architects. Software development has architects. Building industry has architects, right? And these people are often thought of separately. So when, when these statements were created, it was quite revolutionary for people to consider architecture being owned within the team. Okay? Um, I, didn't, I, I was trying to find an excuse for this slide, and this one seemed to fit. Um, uh <laughs> so so while, while we'd like you know, to be all US Marines, right, lumping that one big log of wood, uh, we tend to have, you know, meanwhile in Russia, the, kind of the, one, the one big lady carrying, carrying the tree on the right. Um, Ah, so, um, I've just ruined it. So, uh, who can tell me where those four statements? I've just given you four statements, right? Some quite practical, some quite basic, some stuff you already know, okay? So, I know some people who've paid attention to the slide switch, but can anybody tell me where they come from? Apart from you. <laughs> Hands up who's like a, a scrum master in the room. Okay, Scrum Masters, where do, where do any, uh, uh, no, not Scrum Guide, who said that? Oh, you at the back, <laughs> <You're not laughs> yes, they are from the Agile Manifesto, right, these are the principles behind the Agile Manifesto, a lot of people read the Agile Manifesto, see those four, four statements and go, well, that's all I need to know. And quite interestingly, have a look behind the Agile Manifesto at the 12 principles, and you'll find statements like that. And those are the four I picked out around teams, and there probably are arguably more around teams and communication, all those kind of things. But it's quite interesting how often we ignore them. And then when you look at them, they are just things we already know, but we just don't do. So why do we, <laughs> we organise ourselves around projects, right? I mean, think about all the projects you're in at the moment and the people you work with. How did that happen? Okay. Did you go? Did you turn up to work and say, "I want to work with them," or did somebody go, "Hi, hi, Andy. Uh, yeah, this is your team, and you're now you've now got to work with them." And why do we separate the business and developers? This is really common. Okay. This is well, the business department are the thinkers, and the <laughs> the developers are the doers. And we do we separate those kind of two groups. And by the way, th these are all things I. If you want to shout out any answers that you've got, I mean, these are all th considerations that I don't really know. I don't really know the answer to these questions, how we've got to this state where this is the norm, okay? And why do we... <laughs> I love this. So why do we create... Uh, why do we think creative environments are for hippies, okay? Stupid hippies. Um, but why do we think creative environments are for hippie, free thinkers, right? The, the, you know, we think creative people are... Uh, you know, don't do much work and just like to talk and kind of, you know, flounce their arms around, kind of like I'm doing right now. But, you know, why, um, why, do we, why do we think those environments? You know, you look back to the motivation principles, okay, and you kind of, you know, we want these environments where people can be creative, but we stifle that all the time. 
And then you come to this question, right? So had we done all the other things in the statements, we're working together and we're collaborating and we're sitting together, okay? If we were doing all that stuff, so why do we offshore, okay? If you had co-located teams and business, developer, uh, business and developers working together and all these kind of things, um, you know, why do, we, why do we offshore? Anybody want to answer? Go. Cheaper. Ah, is it, hang on. Ah, you got the right, yes. Yeah, yeah well, ah, okay, yes. Yes, I've put cost, okay? Say that again. It's more challenging to manage, it's more challenging to manage yes. Cheaper's an interesting one, okay, so, yep, carry on. Correct. It reduces the risks in terms of uh, you're, you transfer the responsibility if you're from your own organization to another one, to somebody who's actually your third party. And they're responsible for the full quality, for the delivery, for everything else. You don't have to care about that. You're paying them to deliver you what you ask for. Yeah, this is. And at the same time, it, in it increases the risks since you're not in control of those things yeah. sometimes. And you put all of your knowledge to somebody else. Yeah. So they kind of own you. I'm from this part, so it's actually an outsourced company. I'm going to sit down. You so carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, for us, it's pretty good. But for the other company, they transfer the knowledge to you, and you kind of crawl inside of them and like reach out to them. So <laughs> it's hard for them to let go. So and, and that's uh, 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 yes, everything you said is absolutely right. You know, we we. Um, Offshoring as a uh, offshoring as a partner, and I, w we were talking over lunch, weren't we, about this? And uh, we were talking about cost being cheaper, but actually, when you say cost, it actually is more costly because you, while it is cheaper, you may not get what you're paying for, but you think you are. You think you're going to go and do that. Then you've bought a service, right? Some people to act as a service for you, and that's it. You're doomed, right? You're committed to use these people, this company, this outsource. So it's a great first, okay? Space. I worked with a I worked with a um, uh, an organisation that basically couldn't predict their um, uh, how much work they were going to get in, okay, and so they had like a small office. So every time like the work that came in, they went, "Oh, we need more people!" Crap, you know. And then they went and uh, bought a whole load of people offshore, you know, because they thought that was the best way of managing flex in their product cycle. Okay. Um, throw it over the wall mentality is another one. I don't know whether this is a um, I don't know if it's Americanism or, or, or English kind of way of saying it, but this is basically you're taking a problem and just throwing it away. Somebody else's problem, okay? And this is like the offshore partner. We buy teams to, be the, to deliver on our behalf, okay? And I'll come into some examples of this in a minute, okay? My favorite, this is my favorite saying at the, at the moment. Does anybody recognize this? Not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> I love this, it's a Polish proverb basically says it's not my problem, right? We offshore just to give it to somebody else. We offshore to give it, make it somebody else's problem. Um, I love that saying. So, after kind of finding out a little bit more about offshoring, right? So why do we still believe, you know, why do we really use offshore resources, okay? We think it's, well, we know it's more costly now, okay? We know we just kind of use it as, as a problematic. We, we know we use it for, for <laughs> trying to save money, trying to flex when our projects are, you know, are, are, are in trouble. We try and buy people in. But really, why do we keep doing it? Okay? If we know all this stuff is silly, why do we keep doing it? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, so again, if somebody wants, to, somebody wants to kind of shout out what they think the answer to that is, I'm happy to hear. Okay? So that was kind of like, whoa, that escalated quickly, you know. So, uh, you know, it might, okay, the show's over, thank you, quarter of an hour. Um, so let's go back a step, okay? And I thought it'd be really good to kind of go and look at what a team is um, before I give you the kind of the, the follow on part, right? So, what is a team, okay? This, ooh, sound. This might be the first time I can play this with sound. Yeah. Okay, look at this video and I'll, I'll ask you some questions afterwards.
67 seconds. Wow. It's quick, isn't it? It's bound to be an F1 geek in a minute. There you go. So what is a team, right? Um, uh, so actually, it'd be interesting. So what is the difference between those two videos? Okay, what do people what do people notice particularly from the first video? Speed. More. Okay, more people will come on to that. Yes. What else? Hmm? Technology. Yes. What else? Hmm? Technology. Yep. A lot of free time in between the activities. Hmm? Organization. Organization, okay. Everyone has his own role. Specialization, optimization, right? Who felt sorry for the guy, the one guy changing the tires, right? <laughs> Uh, and and but we do these things, and this is uh, I love this video because you can talk about um, you can talk about lean concepts, you can talk about teams. There's loads of kind of optimization things you can talk about. That you can show that to anybody and say, you know, do you want to be the 1950s, you know, uh, Indianapolis team, or do you want to be the 2013? I think it was McLaren or whoever. There's always an F1 geek in the room whenever I play this that says, well, the difference between the first and the last one is they didn't refuel. It's like, okay, yes, they didn't refuel. Yes, there were more people. Are you a project manager? Okay, so, so the, the project manager answer would be, well, they've added more people. Okay? And it's true, they did. Okay? But what you can take from that between those 65 years is they've looked at the process and they've optimized, they've worked as a team, they've added specialization. Okay, it's a really interesting kind of thing to think about, okay, what did, they, what, what did they want to achieve between the two things? Now, when I asked you what's changed, okay, the objective hasn't changed. Okay, the objective, get the car in, do some stuff to it, you know, okay, arguably fuel it, but change the tyres. Um, uh, yeah, change the tyres, I guess, is the only kind of common one, right? But refuel it, you know, and get the car out and onto the track, right? That's the objective. Hasn't changed in 65 years or wh wherever we are now, right? It's just everything around it has changed. So technology's changed. Yeah, it's meant it's got quicker. And these are the things we need to consider when we go about our kind of ways of working is, you know, technology is, is an enabler, but our actually our objectives, you know, of building software hasn't really changed. It's just how we're going to go about it is the thing we need to think about. So I started looking at other types of teams, you know, a bit of inspiration, right? This is, you know, uh, Royal Marines in the UK, okay, high performing, a uh, high-performing military unit, right? They have objectives, they have a boss, they have somebody who tells them, you know, this is what I want you to do. But like kind of Agile and, and, and we, we say in kind of Agile and Scrum is, you know, how you get there is up to the team, okay? They leave the team to be self-organizing. They leave the team to figure out how they're going to take that objective, okay? This is rugby. This is me playing rugby. <laughs> uh, I'm that guy, right? Uh, this is me playing rugby before I, I absolutely annihilated my knee. Um, but rugby is a team, right? That's where Scrum comes from, you know, the kind of bad interpretation, right? But rugby has objectives, you know, defend the ball, attack, you know. And, uh, but realistically, you can't put all the players out on the field and kind of give them an absolute concrete rule book of how to behave, right? They've got to adapt, and they've got to adapt in the environment. So you could be forgiven and say, yeah, it's just the way they're organized, right? And that's a trap, right? It's not just about organization. It's not just about adding more people. You know, they work under rules, limits, and constraints, and we all do. What they've done, okay, rugby, military, F1, they've learned to work within those rules, limits, and constraints, sometimes break them, okay? But more often than not, they've, they've adapted. There's a, there's a US uh, Marine saying, which is improvise, adapt, overcome, which I really like. You know, when they're faced with a problem, they improvise, they adapt, and they overcome. It's kind of like slightly different to the inspector adapt, but I like it. So how often do we go to work feeling like superheroes? Anybody? Okay. Does anybody go to work and say, I'm going to do a really bad job today? 
I thought the cameraman was raising his hand then. No, he's, just, yeah. <laughs> he's just adjusting the camera. I'm going to do a really bad job of this video. Um, of course we don't. Nobody goes to work and says, uh, I'm going to do a really bad job. Okay? We'd all like to go to work and stand in front with our pants over our trousers, right? And we'd all like to kind of stand there and go, I'm going to fix that bug. You know, we'd love to, you know, this is, the, this is how we'd love to work, right? This is what we strive for. <laughs> when I come in, I don't know who this person is. Maybe a superhero geek can tell me. He's like, got a big mace. You know, bash people. Um, Unfortunately, we look like this. You know, wouldn't it be nice? I do know people who have kind of got their their organisational culture, and they've they've managed to get superhero days and all that kind of really fun stuff. But again, it kind of goes back into building that culture. Okay, so there must be something else going on here around teams. Okay, kind of with the kind of with the F1 stuff, right? This is specialisation and creativity and clear goals. The goal hasn't changed in the F1. The goal doesn't change in rugby. The goal doesn't change. Right. We let our goals slip within software development because we can't make up our minds. We can't make a cl clear decision about products. All these kind of things play into it. So, the kind of the title of this is like, you know, uh, um, offshore, uh, how to offshore like a boss. So, um, who's the boss, right? We have these people called bosses or managers, right? Um, and we'd love, we'd love our bosses and managers to look like this, right? We'd love them all to be Hannibal and kind of smoking a big fat cigar and go, yeah, what well on team? You know, who's awesome? You're awesome, all right? But often, okay, we get the Ron Burgundy, which is, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal, right? You know, it's like, you will do exactly as I say. You know, the leadership, the leadership element just goes, right? We don't get that kind of love and feedback from our bosses that we'd like, okay? Failure. <laughs> I love this. Well, there's no I in team, there's a U in failure. Um, and this is, I, I used to call this the blame train. So there was a project I worked on <laughs> where uh, the management were, were very adamant that whenever a problem hit, they'd go and blame somebody for it. And it was like you could just see this escalation in emails coming through. And I used to say, oh, the blame train, you know, doot, doot, the blame train's coming down. Somebody's going to get on board. But, but bosses, you know, we act like there is blame, okay? How do, why do we blame? This goes back to this whole kind of motivational principles, the carrot and the stick, right? If the donkey eats the carrot, we beat it with the stick. Why do we do these things? Um, and this is my, this is my uh, first, first experience in management. When I thought, what I thought management was, you know, what I ended up doing. You know, one of my first jobs, my, f my first management job, I, I looked after a team of very creative people. Um, and I thought my job was to kind of herd them. <laughs> it was to kind of corral them in the direction that I thought they needed to go. Um, and I, I just used to call it herding cats after a while because it just felt like they, they hated me. And I didn't really understand why they hated me until I kind of figured out that actually they don't want, the, you know, they're creative people. They don't want to be herded. They don't want to be told what to do. They want some direction. They want some kind of objective to go and hit. And they just want me to support them. Okay? Really, really simple stuff. Other things in teams, personalities, right? Uh, we, we talked a minute ago about introverted people, okay? Uh, if I look back um, start of my career, I was actually quite an introverted person. I was actually, you know, I wanted to sit there and just kind of do my stuff, you know, and kind of, you know, unite separately in, in different homes to people. <laughs> and, uh, but we have this personality in software developers. And it's, and it's really quite hard to coach people out of that. You know, giving them opportunities to stand and speak, you know, giving them opportunities to kind of push themselves, especially when they're junior, right? You've got junior people who, who you want to get into an agile culture. <coughs> Try and push them a little bit. Try and give them challenges that, so that gets them up in front and talking. I was once challenged that I'd never get a development team doing a retrospective. So uh, retrospective, you know, you're kind of getting up and you're putting stuff on the walls and all these kind of things. And, and uh, another Scrum Master um, just said, oh, you'll never do it. And, I was, and all I did, and I said, there you go, guys. There's three topics on the wall. Go and fill it out. And they kind of sat there for a few minutes kind of going, who's this guy? Oh, my God. He's just sitting down doing nothing. <laughs> and I sat there. And I just waited for them to do what they needed to do. And eventually they did. They all got up. They all contributed. And I said, as you're getting up, come and speak to us. And they all did it. Um, now, whether they went back to their desk after me and went, oh, God, he's awful. I don't know. But, but you've got to watch out for introverted people. Okay? And, and when I mean watch out, I mean look after and kind of you know, work with them. Um, my second 
note on personalities um, was was a uh, he was a tester. Not that I hate testers. Not that I I think testers are, are in any way all like this one person. But there was one guy on a team, um, and uh, he would block. He thought he felt it, it was his goal to block all the development. So he thought, you know, my job is to protect everything, regardless of whether the product owner said it was a good job. Okay, the product owner was like, yeah, I'm, f I'm really happy with this product. <laughs> and this tester was like, no, not to my standards, it's, no, it's not going anywhere. And the product owner was like, no, it's my money, you know, I'm paying for you, it's good enough, right? So there was this huge conflict. Burn down was just like flatlining because there was no resolve, right? Even though the team were doing a good job of running tests and all that kind of stuff, there was no resolve. The story about this guy is um, he, we, we had a, a social event uh, at a pub and he had a few drinks and he ended up playing football and broke his leg. And so the next day when he didn't come in, we were able to close off all, <laughs> all the stories that he wouldn't let, com you know, go and com let, let the team complete. And the productivity and the motivation in the team was great because suddenly they were achieving. And they weren't, there was no detriment in quality. They were still building a quality product, but they, they, we eliminated, you know, in one, <laughs> in one way or another, we eliminated something that was blocking the team. Uh, and I, I stick my hand up, I had nothing to do with his broken leg, I, I promise. And I wouldn't advise this as any tactic, right, for, for dealing with these people. So, we're here at an Agile conference, okay? What's an Agile team, okay? What's the difference? So we talked about teams. We've kind of covered a little bit about management and, and the kind of the personalities and uh, what a team looks like in F1 and rugby and, and military and all those kind of things. So, so what's an agile team? You know, what, we wouldn't be here without an agile team, right? So um, Scrum, yay! Uh, I love minions, sorry. Um, uh, what does Scrum say? Scrum says, uh, Scrum master, product owner, and team. Um, by the, by the way, if you haven't guessed by now, I like telling stories, and I like telling stories with lots of slides. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> um, uh, so Scrum Master, Product Owner, and Team, okay? That's what Scrum says. And this is where you get the conflict of, well, what does a project manager do? What does a business analyst do? What does, you know, somebody sitting somewhere do? Scrum's really revolutionary in that fact because it doesn't tell you. It doesn't give you any answer to that. It just says these are the roles you should have. It doesn't tell you who should be in the team, what role they should play, how they interact, all these kind of things. Okay. Kanban, Kanban. Okay, Kanban's really quite awesome. Okay, because Kanban goes, let me see what you got. Okay, team awesome, assemble. But Kanban basically says, you know, give me what you got and we'll work with it. Okay, we'll look at how you work and we'll, we'll try and work better. We'll try and work through all the inefficiencies in this process to work smoother. Okay. So I tried to find one more example of, of Agile teams. Um, and I thought I'd go and look at DSDM. Okay. Uh, hands up, anybody know DSDM? One, one person at the back. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No. Good. Um, <laughs> everyone paying attention, right? Um, uh, DSDM is, a, is an agile, another agile framework. It could even go as far as being called a methodology. Okay, in so much that it's very, very prescriptive. It's kind of on the it's on the waterfally scale of if you're going to look at a, a prescriptive agile framework, it's it's on that waterfally scale. Um, so I tried to find something, some funny meme, right? I've tried to find something funny about DSDM. Um, and what I realize is there is nothing funny about DSDM. Um, and I, I thought I'd bring up the, the picture of what DSDM's uh, <laughs> team framework looks like. Um, until I showed it to somebody, I showed it to another Agile coach, and he said, Andy, don't you realize this is the alien baby? Uh, and I went, yeah, actually, that, that, you know, you look at it like an alien baby, that is quite funny, right? Um, but DSDM is, is kind of crazy, and it has all these people like a workshop facilitator and a solution tester and a, oh, I don't know, you know, it's just, it just, this again just doesn't fit in our world, right? It doesn't fit in our traditional transformation, waterfall process world. You know, it's revolutionary again. No wonder people have trouble with Agile and moving that way. So, we're kind of flying actually. So, is offshoring different? Okay. Is our offshoring any different in terms of teams, in terms of people, in terms of culture, in terms of you know, our understanding of what teams do and how they work and all this kind of stuff? And no, <laughs> they're not different, okay? But we do it wrong. 
I don't, know, it's, I don't know whether that's exactly grammatically correct, but we do it wrong or do it badly or however else you want to say it, right? So when you look at the Agile Manifesto and it says individuals and, oh, hang on, because what we t tend to do is we have a product owner here, you know, with their backlog and a team, okay? And then we buy in some people, you know, we go and buy one guy, we go and buy two guys. And this is actually how an organization I worked for worked, right? They would just go and buy, when they needed to flex and scale, they would just go and buy one or two people, okay? Now, what you end up with is managing it through tooling, okay? So you have this, let's hide behind the internet thing, which is, which is genius, because it knocks out all that good stuff about communication. It fo people start falling back on communicating through tools like Jira. And we forget about really good things like Skype, you know, and we'll use Trello to communicate. And that's, uh, it's just not an excuse, you know, because everything I've kind of talked to you so far about have been co-located teams, teams that work and function together. You can't have a Royal Marine team or an F1 team, right? Half of them sitting in the pit lane, <laughs> you know, t a car comes in, it's like, change the tire. Well, I'm over here, you know, I can't change that tire. You know, we know teams need to be together to succeed. Yeah, it's really obvious. Yeah. We've been offshoring for, for decades when you think about it, right? We've been offshoring, we've been asking other people in other countries to do work on our behalf, okay? And very rarely do we kind of say, you know, uh, one guy, two guys, three guys, sorry, ladies, you know, people, right? Very rarely do we kind of ask one or two people to do the work. But even when we do, we ask them to produce something for us. We never say, hey, we're going to build a ship in the UK. We want you to build this one really, really specific part on your own, okay? Never test when it integrates, never find out, and then just ship it to us when we think we're going to, we're going to hit our integration, right? We don't work like that, okay? We haven't done for centuries. So distributed teams, okay, are, look like this. We have a product owner with, with the product backlog, and we have Scrum uh, <coughs> Sprint backlog, excuse me, and this is, the, this is the example, right? We have one guy sitting there and two people sitting somewhere else. And what happens with communication? Ooh, uh, sorry. Uh, what happens with communication? It goes nuts, right? Because you have all these, all these people trying to talk to each other to deliver against these two sprint backlogs, you know, against that one product backlog, and you end up in a mess. You end up in this horrible mess where you can't actually succeed. Okay? Or if you do succeed, it's with a lot and lot of work. So, I am flying through this, actually, I have to say. You're going to get a nice break in a minute. Um, so, I did say at the start, I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know. Okay? Well, apart from this, okay? how do you offshore like a boss? Okay? You don't do it. Okay? If you're going to offshore, you don't offshore. And what do I, what I mean by this? I mean, if you're going to offshore, but if you have to, offshore with a purpose. Now, what I mean by this is offshore as a team, okay? Have a team sitting somewhere offshore that delivers together, has its own control, have its, has its own autonomy, has integration with all the tools and stuff, but you don't buy in those one or two people just because you need to flex, just because you need to scale, okay? If you have to offshore, okay? Co-location as a team. All the examples I've given you, people sitting together, right? If you're a team today, you know, you're all sitting together, right? People who would be listening in on Skype might not get the same vibe that you guys are getting, you know, in front of me. You're like, oh, God, when's he going to finish? You know, but, you know, you need to be co-located to succeed. We know this stuff. There's nothing new about this, right? They need to be self-autonomous. They need to have the ability to make their own decisions. They need to have the ability to guide their own future, to manage how they're going to achieve that objective. You think back at the kind of the F1 and the 1950s example, right? Was it really essential that they polished, <laughs> polished the framework of the car? You know, was it really essential? You know, a self-autonomous team might give that, you know, the guy who's over-polishing the car a clip around the back of the ear and say, no, you get on with changing the other tire. You know, you never know. Trust, big one, okay? You've got to trust your teams, okay? If you have to offshore, you've got to trust them to deliver, okay? <coughs> the negative for this is you can't put them under any penalty clause, okay? So if you buy an offshore team, you can't say, you know, if you don't deliver, da 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 da, da right? Something bad's going to happen to you because you're instantly breaking trust, okay? Offshore, 
all teams fail. So you've got to expect if you buy an offshore team, they're going to fail as well, right? It's how you manage that and how you build the trust is the essential part of all this. Yeah. So what you should do is end up with a model that looks more like that. Okay? Product owners in every location, sprint backlogs in every location, working off a product backlog. Okay? I can't remember whether there's a, no. Well, it actually, it does go into maximize communication. But the trick here is maximizing the communication for this. Okay? Product owners all talking, scrum teams having some coordination meetings, scrum of scrums, right? I've seen plenty, plenty of organizations that work with offshore partners where they work in this model and really, really successfully. And the great thing is where they had, I mean, I haven't got a kind of, this assumes that the Scrum Master's in here, but realistically, I've seen great uh, examples where you have, a, you have a central Scrum Master, a Scrum Lead, and he just coordinates everything else that's going on. So he introduces the teams to each other. He makes sure that they're, they're working okay, that their you know, environments are all there, you know, over and above everything else they're going on. He looks after and he nurtures. It's that coaching. Okay? He's there to ensure that this, this kind of model works for the organization and works for the product. So maximize the communication, look for Scrum of Scrums opportunities, look for um, uh, tooling, you know, and use things like Skype. There's a great example um, uh, of, a, of a team in IBM where what they did is they had a, <laughs> they had a monitor with a, a webcam with, with Skype running uh, 24 hours a day. Okay, so when they left the office, they'd wave to the team offshore, and the team was, were self-autonomous, right? their own team. And they, they used to leave it open. So all day, if anyone wanted to talk to the other team, they could just kind of knock on the camera and like, you know, wave and then somebody else, it's like a window into the other office, right? Somebody, you know, kind of come along and wave back. And it got to the point, apparently, where they just used to kind of randomly shout jokes at each other through this, through this window and they used to celebrate birthdays and all these kind of things. And they built a really good culture by having that face-to-face, -face, right? Think back at the principles, right? Face-to-face -face communication. And we have tools around us now, you know, and we don't use these things. And it's, I just think it's a real, real shame. Tools. I've just outdone myself of a slide. So, the final point um, is bring offshore onshore. Um, we used to do this a lot where when we did buy offshore partners, okay, and we, we used to have teams, we used to bring them over to the UK for a couple of weeks get to know the team, right? It's almost like that Skype in a window thing, but actually physically, right? We used to go and take them out for some food and welcome them. And blah, blah, blah. So when you talk to them on the phone, when you couldn't do webcam chats, when you couldn't do all the really kind of cool things, whenever you introduce yourself, they go, oh, yeah, no, yeah, you're the guy I met, you know? And we built that relationship. We built that trust. Five minutes, amazing. Um, we built that relationship and we built that trust with them. You know, instantly, because they got to know us physically in person. Well, not physically, that just sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 um, but we got to know them personally, you know, really personally. It was really good. You know, it was a, just a really good thing. So, if all else fails with your offshoring and you have no choice and you don't do all this, I want you to remember um, old man with beard, uh, Darth Vader, uh, who's awesome, and um, big Russian lady. Um, so that was, with a bit of time to spare, uh, how to offshore like a boss. Um, I'll take questions, thank you. <laughs> what do you do in case when you don't actually have the ability to bring the product owner on location with the company to work? Skype, I mean, any, any way you can introduce that face-to-face -face regularly. You know, if they can't come into to the physical location, they need to make, I mean, the, the thing about a product owner is they need to be available for the team whenever the team need them. So. An additional question. Uh, what do you do when there is a, there is really no uh, significant time overlap? Oh, so, you, so somebody said to me recently, they said, um, Longitude hurts, latitude kills. I think it was one of the two, right? And it was all, it was all about that, that time switch and how you manage those kind of things. Um, I, I would go back to my, my first point, which was being don't do it. You know, if you really have that, that hurting and that killing of people sitting in different geos, and I know, I mean, IBM has that all over the place and we have this problem, but I will always say don't do it unless you absolutely have to. 
You know, and if you if you do have that problem, think about trying to bring bring that role where the where the kind of the development center is. Right, you've got to bring it closer to where the product's being delivered. You know, that would be my advice. Any other questions? Was that good? Was that good? I mean, it's the first time I've actually delivered it to an audience, so I didn't know actually how it was going to go. So, so was that? Everybody get something out of it? Old men and big Russian ladies. Good. Okay. Oh. How many times? What, on daily? <laughs> How many times? Uh, quite a lot. Okay, but, it, but it, it's hard. And, and um, uh, we, we talked about culture, right? You can't change culture, you can influence it. Okay, it goes back to your question, like, how do you get these people who are new to it? You can only do so much. Okay, if the organization around them isn't going to work in exactly the same way, they're going to get pretty fed up and they're going to revert back to uh, you know they're going to get revert back to that type so there's a lot more to it than just training and coaching there's also that kind of support network around them and the organization and the way that works that will kind of help with those kind of things but there's no typical agile answer right there's no there's no you know I can't give you an answer today cool I'm going to stop talking and get a cup of tea. I am talking a bit later um, on a completely different subject, but there are like, like two or three slides which are the same. So you can laugh again if you want to turn up later, but thank you very much. Oh, dear. Lovely. <laughs> thank you very much.